The Hall effect is another neat phenomenon that can occur due to a magnetic field. We already saw that a magnetic field can generate a magnetic force on a current carrying wire that can literally pull the wire in a certain direction. The reason is those many forces that the charges all feel are passed onto the wire itself since the charges are trapped inside. This probably seems like a reasonable model for a long thin wire, and it is. But what if the current wasn't flowing through a wire? What if we had electric current going through a thin metal slab like this? It's thin in one dimension, but thick in the other dimension. What happens now? In order to see what happens, it actually matters how we model the electric current here. So we're going to show a positive current in a conducting metal as it truly is, namely free electrons moving in the opposite direction. Again, there are normally chaotic thermal and quantum effects involved in electron movement, so things are not actually as smooth as we see here, but this is good enough for what we're trying to discuss. So if we have electric current moving to the right, which is equivalent to free electrons moving to the left with some drift velocity v sub d, what kind of force are they going to experience due to an external magnetic field? If the magnetic field is into the screen, the electrons are going to feel a force in which direction? As always, the right hand rule will let us know. Taking our right hand and pointing our fingers in the direction of the electron movement, and then curling them in the direction of the magnetic field, which is into the screen, the magnetic force on a positive moving charge would be downwards. Since electrons are negatively charged though, the magnetic force is actually upwards on them. If the force is upwards, the electrons tend to be pulled upwards here because they have some room to move up through this thick slab. So what's the big deal? The catch is, while the electrons are deflected upwards by the magnetic field, they now feel an attractive downwards electric force towards the excess positive charge because a potential difference now exists between the top and bottom of the slab. This is what's known as the Hall effect, named after Edwin Hall who discovered it. As a result of all this, contrary to what you might expect, this thin metal slab doesn't feel a net magnetic force upwards. Before, the current carrying wires we were using were just too thin in order for moving charges to be able to accumulate enough on one side and generate a reasonable potential difference. There's not enough space to create a strong enough potential difference, so the moving charges are kind of trapped and transfer the magnetic forces they feel onto the wire itself. In the slab scenario, that's not the case. There is enough space for the electrons to accumulate on one side and create a strong enough potential difference and electric force that counteracts the magnetic force that the electrons feel. Then the electrons in steady state don't transfer any force to the slab since they themselves feel an electric force that opposes the magnetic force on average. So that's all nice and dandy, but how do we put numbers to this? In order to make logical progress, we're going to simplify the crap out of this. We'll simply ignore all the asymmetries here and assume that in steady state, the electrons distribute themselves so that they create a uniform electric field in the upwards direction, meaning electrons would feel electric forces in the downwards direction. Also, we'll assume that in steady state, after the initial electrons have had time to accumulate on top because of the magnetic field, the later electrons just travel in a straight line from one end to the other end at constant speed. If that's the case, then the upwards magnetic force, which is QVB in magnitude here, since the velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field, that magnetic force is perfectly balanced by the electric force, which is opposite the electric field that the electrons create internally. The internal electric field would generate an electric force in the upwards direction for a positive charge, so a downwards direction for these negatively charged electrons. Also keep in mind, there is no external electric field. These electrons are reacting to the internal electric field generated by excess charge on either side. We'll call the magnitude of the electric force as QE, where E is the internal electric field strength. Since the two forces are perfectly balanced in our simplified model, we have QVB equals QE. We can cancel out the Q and we're left with VB equals E. From here we know, if we have a perfectly uniform electric field, we can write the magnitude of the potential difference between the top and bottom of the slab as just the magnitude of the electric field times the height of the slab, which we'll call d. Then the drift velocity of the electrons times the magnetic field strength is equal to the potential difference divided by the distance between the top and bottom of the slab. Solving for the potential difference, we get VBD. This is what's known as the Hall voltage. 
It's a voltage or potential difference you could physically measure between the top and bottom of the slab if you connected a voltmeter across the current carrying slab which is pretty cool. You usually think of connecting a voltmeter between two points across the length of a current carrying conductor, not across the cross section of the current itself, which is totally bizarre. But here in the presence of a magnetic field, we would measure an actual voltage roughly given by this equation here, VBD. We can take this just one step further. See, having the drift velocity in this equation doesn't really help us all that much since we can't directly measure it with an instrument. But we remember our formula for the current in a current carrying conductor is NQAV, where V is the drift velocity. So solving for the drift velocity, we have the current divided by the number of charge carriers per unit volume, usually known to us, the charge on the charge carrier itself, it's probably just negative E for an electron if we're dealing with a metal slab, and the cross-sectional area of the conductor. We can plug all this in for our drift speed, and we have IDB over NQA, the cross-sectional area of the slab A is just going to be D times T, where T is the thickness of the slab. So our final expression for the Hall voltage across this slab is IB over NQT. The current times the magnetic field strength, all divided by the number of charge carriers per unit volume, times the charge on each charge carrier, times the thickness of the slab. Now, what exactly don't we know here? We know the Hall voltage for sure, we can just measure it with a voltmeter. Same with the thickness, we can measure that too. The current we can also easily measure using an ammeter. So if we know the magnetic field, this expression for the Hall voltage gives us an easy way to approximate the value NQ. Usually this NQ is grouped into a constant called R sub H, where R sub H is equal to 1 over NQ. This RH is known as the Hall coefficient. So if we know the magnetic field, we can determine a reasonable value for the Hall coefficient for the metal that makes up the slab. Incidentally, you can go the other way around too. If you already know the Hall coefficient of the metal that the slab is made out of, say from a table lookup, you can use that and all the other values to estimate the value of a stray magnetic field. So using nothing but a DC circuit and an ammeter and a voltmeter, you can figure out the value of a stray magnetic field.